why do you feel like there is so much confusion and variance and, and advice when it comes to the nutritional field? Mm. I think there's a, there's a bunch of different reasons, but one of the major reasons that I see online is putting too much stock into our own personal anecdote and our personal experience with something is important and I don't want to invalidate that, but there are a number of biases that are at play and we may be unaware of when we're considering our anecdote and wanting to communicate that as the solution for everyone. And, you know, often some of the things that kind of come to mind when, when I think about anecdotes is, you know, we might make a bunch of changes to our diet, but then we attribute it to, to one thing. <laughs> so we can kind of oversimplify that. It's not controlled. So we have no idea of sort of comparing it to something else, right. which is what clinical studies allow us to do. So for example, you know, for if I do something to my diet and I feel better, for every Simon that does that, how many Andres or Riches or other people are there that would have done the same thing and had a different outcome? Right. So we can get blindsided by our anecdote and we can become very passionate about our personal experience. We all eat, right? Which is why we all have something to say about it, <laughs> which is a little different to other areas of science where there's a little bit less confusion and divisiveness. So that's one kind of central area. The other is that you can almost go out and find a study to support any claim you want. <laughs> and the reason you know, for, for that is that there are, there are certain principles within nutrition science that you need to understand to make sense of the findings. When we're looking at a food or a nutrient, you know, whether that, that is healthy or neutral or unhealthy depends on a number of things. What are you comparing it against? What dose are we talking about here? Um, for who? Whose genes? And if you're looking at, at studies and you're not considering these principles, then you can come to some, you know, potentially inaccurate sort of conclusions. And those are some of the things that we might dive into. But, you know, much of that comes back to being trained in nutrition science and understanding these principles so that when you're delving into the research, you can actually make sense of things. And then understanding that there are different types of science and they're not all equal. Not all science is created equal. You know, different um, sort of study designs, whether we're talking about looking at cells in a Petri dish, like a sort of in vitro, or we're looking at animal studies um, or observational studies of humans or clinical trials. These are all important, but they're not equally as valid or reliable as each other. And so some of those, you know, more what we would call as bench science, which is looking under the microscope or even animal studies, these are hypothesis generating type of, of experiments. And what that means is that they're interesting from a mechanistic point of view, but they're very reductionist. And so we can use those to come up with new questions and new hypotheses that we then want to go and test in humans. And when you're testing in humans, then you have to think about what are the, the different types of sort of ways of, of investigating you know, a nutrition related question. And that could be a very long-term obs observational type study that allows you to look over decades and allow sufficient time for people to have health issues like a heart attack or develop cancer and, and develop some associations. Or it might be shorter term clinical trials where perhaps you don't have long enough because of uh, financial resources usually to track people over decades and see hard health outcomes. But what you can look at is, you know, intermediate short-term changes to things that we know predict disease, like changes to your blood pressure or changes to your cholesterol or um, changes to muscle size or strength, things like of, of that nature. So um, I think not fully appreciating that all, not all science is equal and understanding right. where these different pieces of the puzzle fit in. And ultimately, when I'm looking at the evidence, I'm considering that 
what we would call evidence hierarchy. And then I'm looking for converging lines of evidence. Mm. So the mechanistic stuff that we see that's highly reductionist is pointing into the same direction as what you see in long-term observational studies. And that's corroborated by what you see in clinical trials. It's perfect. I was just going to go there next. I was just kind of curious how you prioritize or on that hierarchy of the variance of efficacy for these different types of studies, what are the the most important that you feel like uh, actually translate to the most truth and reality? Mm-hmm. When it comes to nutrition, it's going to be long-term observational studies. And these are not all equal either. <laughs> you can have um, a, a sort of poorer quality observational study versus a high quality and you know, we could go into the weeds for hours on, on what differentiates those. But some, you know, one really important high level thing is if you're going out and looking at a food related nutrition question in a population and you track them for 30 years, I want to see that they didn't just look at their diet at the start. I want to know that every three or four years they kept tracking their diet throughout because let's face it, people don't eat exactly the same over time you know, diets change. So you need to have those multiple sort of time points where you're surveying people. And then even that that food frequency questionnaire, you know, a lot of people will will say food frequency questionnaires are rubbish. You know, how can we rely on them? But they're unaware that these are actually validated instruments or they should be. And what that means is I can can create a food frequency questionnaire and I can get Andre to complete it for me. And at the same time, I'll get him to do a weighed food record where you're actually weighing all of your food. And I want to see that that food frequency questionnaire correlated really well to the, to the weighed food records. And, and then we know that if we go out and use that food frequency questionnaire, because we can't get 60,000, 100,000 people to weigh all their food, we know that it's giving us a good idea as to their dietary pattern. So observational studies, they allow us, as I said earlier, to look... L- sort of long-term at these hard health outcomes, which is really important. Clinical trial, Mm -hmm. most of the time, don't allow us to do that. But sitting above observational studies in terms of reliability and validity is these controlled trials um, because there's less variables at play. Hopefully, the only difference between the two groups, if randomized well, is the dietary exposure. So, for example, if you were looking at saturated fat, Uh, versus polyunsaturated fats, then you would have one group who is exposed to a higher amount of saturated fats. The other group has a higher exposure to polyunsaturated fats, lower exposure to saturated fats, but everything else is the same. And you can look at these intermediate sort of changes in, in biomarkers that we know are associated with disease risk. And then sitting above those, those two is meta analyses and Uh, particularly meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. So what we want to really see is repeatable, replicated results from different um, research groups around the world. And one of the kind of nice tools that we have is if there are a number of experiments that have essentially looked at the same thing or very similar thing, we can pull those results together. And so we might have eight different studies that have looked at that example I just showed you. And and I'm thinking of a a meta-analysis here that compares saturated fat to polyunsaturated fats. Let's put them together and then see what is the the sort of overall net result outcome here. And that gives us a little bit more confidence in the results that this isn't just a sort of one-off. We're seeing this sort of more broadly when we pull data and have more subjects involved.